back near his hometown. I mean, he's got a, a one-month-old daughter, uh, daughter, I believe he's a daughter, um, <clears throat> baby at home. Uh, he's a you know pretty busy guy, yeah. but he is loving being here at McGill, getting a, a you know great education. These are two fantastic schools. What a strip by Balden. Ball still popping loose. And nice job by Gallo to just run out and grab that one. Yeah, Balden showing off why he's been one of the most dominant defenders in Kufel lacrosse in the East Division, at least since he's you know, headed on campus in Montreal with this Redmonds program. He's just so athletic. And when he does lose that step, he's got the strength just to strip with that pole. And, and it's a beautiful takeaway there for the Redmond. Yeah, Balden, a, a native of Brantford, Ontario, taking civil engineering. So not exactly a, a cake course load. No. Civil engineering. He's got some work to do. He's a bright kid and a great athlete. Here's a chance going behind the net. Cutter through the middle. They can't connect, but it does get through to the second man. And that shot taken by Kieran McKay goes wide. They'll start with it once again. Welcome to everyone who's just able to join us. I know we had some technical difficulties. We are 13 minutes into the first quarter of this quarterfinal. McGill leading the University of Toronto one to nothing. An early goal by, who got the goal? Was it Chase Fraser? Andrew Chase. Andrew Chase, yes. Chase Fraser. Chase Fraser. <laughs> <laughs> no, not Chase Fraser. He is playing for the, well, hoping to play for the Buffalo Bandits at some point. McGill with possession once again. Toronto having a pretty good start here. I mean, this is this is good stuff mm -hmm. for them. Forcing McGill into some turnovers. Forcing them to really work for the points that they get. Of course, McGill doesn't mind that. They don't mind a structured possession. A little bit of a dodge from the top by McKay. He's flattened as he gets that shot away. Yeah, great job by Caden Jackson. To, you know, throw the body there as that shot's uh, being finished by McKay. And that's the style of play that these midfielders like to play. Oh, nice job to elude the trail check. And that's Liam McDonald getting that goal. That's just a lovely play as, you know, he just was so aware of where that check was coming from. Yeah, he, he could, uh, you know, almost feel it all the way coming through. And, and McDonald, one of the top scorers on this team, 15 goals, 15 assists for a, a clean 30 during the regular season. Uh, but just one of these pure dodging midfielders, as you saw, he just, just a little sidestep and just unloads. And he actually took a hit there, too, on he the way really down. He took a big bump. He was nailed by Sean Power, absolutely flattened as he took the shot, but took paid the price to get that goal. There was a violation on the faceoff by Caden Jackson, so you hand the ball to Gardy Kerr, and it's tough not to incur the, the all-Canadian faceoff guy. You know you've got to try and get an edge, get a jump, and sometimes you go just a little bit early. There's the ball in the hands of Hunter Zawada. Two to nothing, McGill leads. Thanks for being with us here at the Bagatoway Cup 2018 from the University of Toronto's Varsity Stadium. I'm Stephen Stamp with Pat Gregoire. This is Lacrosse TV's presentation of the game. Over to the far side to Kai McDonald. They have a lot of Max at McGill. A lot of MCs, a lot of MACs. Obadia comes running out from behind GLE. A little swim move. That pass doesn't connect. And off goes Macon Jeffries, the Willington, Connecticut native. native. Oh, that's a big mistake. You can't just hand the ball no. over to McGill like that. No, man. absolutely not. And you could I don't know if it came from one of the parents or fans in the stands or someone on the on the far side, but we said, we need to get a good clear here. Let's slow down, and as that happens, the ball's turned over. And like you said, you can't do that against McGill. They'll just make you pay. Here's a chance, and ripped by Obadia. He's so dangerous. I mean, he just he just slipped into that open space. And then quickly, Zach Holmes, the all-Canadian defender, will go and pick him up. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you, you, if you look at the numbers, Obadi is the clear guy that you want to get on. But, um, you know, there's so many dangerous players yeah. Oh, yeah, on this McGill attack. And, very balanced. Obadi is one of the other Lafayette uh, Division I uh, transfers as well. Pass to the cutter, but Murdoch can't make that, that catch. We have a crease violation. Toronto will get the ball. A.J. Masson up in the offensive zone for Toronto, number 29. He's running to the middle. He's actually wearing the helmet with the, in the middle with the, the white peak. I, think, I guess they all do except for, looks like 
Jason Barnable here has just got the blue. I don't think he's got the peak. Jason Barnable doesn't have the white peak. Anyway, McGill gets possession. Barnable gives pursuit. But Masson, an interesting story. We figured it out his ninth year of collegiate lacrosse. Yeah. He is in graduate school here at the University of Toronto. Went to Vermont, did a full program there. Came up here for grad school. We believe he's into a PhD now. I know he was uh, doing a master's. I'd hope so for being yeah. in school for that long. <laughs> yeah. But boy, he is, uh, I mean, a smart, smart lacrosse player. Terrific leader for, you know, a veteran, that kind of veteran player mm -hmm. for this team. Toronto leaving some space, but they do get back. And another big hit. They're making McGill pay for their shots. Andrew Chase gets flattened. I thought they'd left Kieran McKay a little too much space on think, the two-man game. I think it was just a miscommunication between yeah. uh, Hickey and, and Power there. That pass gets away from McGill. They've thrown a few balls away, and Toronto will get possession of this one. But yeah, like you said, that's, that's probably Sean Power's third or even fourth big hit that he's thrown. Yeah. Loves to throw the body, and they don't mind putting him as a short, you know, a short stick D midi onto someone who can who can do some damage because they feel like he can cover pretty much anybody that they they need to throw him up against. Swim move by Barnable, another one switches hands, runs into some open space, picked up by Balden, and again we're going to see that matchup all night. Balden will retreat now, but he's aware of where Barnable is mm -hmm. at all times. You see him there, take that little peek. Just to make sure he knows, because they're aware that Barnable is the dangerous one. Although, I mean, Nick Pizer with 24 goals, you better keep an eye on him as well. Pizer's the righty over on the far side, just running down to GLE, past the ball carrier there. It was Darren Elliott. Comes back up top, and Alex Emerson is going to trot over to our near side as A.J. Masson throws it behind the net. There's Pison. He's got the D midi, Ryan A. Bear. Gets a shot off, but it is blocked. Balden snags it, then very calmly tosses it ahead. And here comes Bolsterly on the run. He's loading it up. Passes, nice movement. Oh, off the post. Glorious chance there for Patrick Turner, but can't beat the iron. McGill will get the ball back. I, you know, you and I we were both long poles. I was, I was pulling for Bolsterly to load it up and let that rip. Yeah, Bolsterly scored his first goal of the season last week as well, but electing to feed Maxine Murdoch and Murdoch just finds Turner on the other side. Turner just unlucky hits the outside of the pipe. Murdoch loads up his own, calls his own number, skips one through. Little fake pass there used Zawada as a decoy, and that just opened up enough space for him to have plenty of room to fire a absolute rocket low yeah Murdoch he's got such a great underhand release he's got the great overhand release too but we always see him come around almost uses the defender as a screen and just throws that little skipper which you don't see too often in the field game anymore but it's perfectly placed right in the bottom corner just a few seconds left in the quarter as Max Murdoch finishes that one off after 20 minutes of play it is McGill 3 the University of Toronto 2 this is the Big Attaway Cup 2018 on lacrosse TV at the University of Toronto's Varsity Stadium I'm Stephen Stamp with Pat Gregoire just a uh, mention that this game is a copyright broadcast of lacrosse tv and the canadian university field lacrosse association no retransmission or rebroadcast is allowed in any form without express written consent of lacrosse tv and kufla so that's a pretty good quarter for u of t mcgill i think they're going to want to be a little bit sharper um but I think, I mean, Tim Murdoch was saying, this is a good good Toronto team. They're not, you know, they were 4-6 and six on the season, scored 92 goals, gave up 131, whereas McGill's 9-1, and one, scored 154, gave up just 56. On paper, this is a substantial mismatch. But playing at home, they've been preparing all week with the bye week, and, and Toronto's come out and, and played pretty well. Yeah, and I think they've executed a, a very strong game plan, and I think they've changed what they're normally used to. Usually, they, they don't mind giving up those outside shots from the midfielder. They're pretty confident uh, that Macon Jeffries or whoever it may be in between the pipe can take those shots. Not saying that they don't have confidence in their goaltender. In fact, I, I know they're very impressed with what Jeffries has been able to do in his freshman season. But they just feel that 
leaving those outside shots on the run from this McGill's uh, talented midfielders is not going to work. So what have they done? You know, guys like Sean Power, Caden Jackson, some short stick D middies have had to extend out maybe a little more than they're used to, mm -hmm. but they've gotten more physical and, and it's worked to their favor. Yeah, it's gone pretty well. I mean, down three, nothing to McGill is not that bad when you think about the circumstances. Uh, you know, and good for Toronto. I mean, it, it is, I'll tell you, people are raving about this facility being down in the heart of Toronto. Uh, Tim Murdoch was just loving it. He's like, this is great. They took the train down. They took uh, Via Rail down. And they just absolutely loved that. He's like, it's so much better. <laughs> you know, the bus, you get to home around. Oh, yeah. uh, you, the scenery is nice. I've done that train trip up to Montreal. It's, uh, and back. And it's, it's lovely. Yeah, it's, 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 it's awesome. Nice ride. Going up, uh, my partner Carrie and I plan to head up to Montreal in a couple of weeks. Very nice. Uh, yeah, check out some spots where she could play. She's uh, got a new album coming out in uh, in January. Her second album, very excited. Singer songwriter. She's she's fantastic. She, she, and her first album, just as before we get back to play, her first album, Wheels of the Grand, is now on iTunes. Go check her out. Carrie Jane, J A Y N E, there you is go. her stage name. Voice of an angel. I really like her. <laughs> <laughs> That's fairly clear for anyone who knows us. Yes. Yeah. Uh, McGill with possession once again off this opening face off a drive to the net. Switching hands are ripped. Shot by Andrew Chase. Chase is really stepping up here. Probably the standout so far for McGill. They'll reset. Here's another shot on the run. That one goes off a defender. I believe it hit uh, George Brown, the LSM. Went way up in the air. Nice job by the goalie to point out where it was. But eventually the ball bounces around straight back to McGill. And Kieran McKay is just going to slow things down. Near side is McDonald. Gives it to Max Murdoch. He's watched there by Samuel Gaskin. Now they'll switch off. He's got the short stick on him. He's going to try and create something. He does and scores. And that's Murdoch just recognizing that he had Sean Power on him. Who again can play solid defense. But... That's your advantage when you get the short pole on. Yeah, it's their advantage, and that's the advantage of having such talent, you know, on attack, on midfield, whatever it may be. You can only have four long poles on the field, so that's going to give some opportunities. And the, and the one that, you know, got the short stick there is Max Murdoch. And like you said, he recognizes, just leans down on Sean Power, and again, throws that low to low shot and plays perfectly. Fascinating. I mean, McGill. Such an international school, draws people from everywhere. Max Murdoch and Cougar Kirby. Murdoch from Montreal, Kirby from Ganawage, the only two Quebec people, Quebec natives. Uh, and Cougar Kirby from the Ganawage Reserve. So really, you could say Max Murdoch, the only one from, you know, a Canadian from the yeah. province of Quebec. Uh, Kirby, of course, from the First Nation. Seeing that replay again, Sean Power actually played pretty strong defense, just maybe yeah. just the one second. But I think U of T maybe got to think about sliding there. You know, there was an a opportunity. Little a little help wouldn't hurt. Well, it just, it seemed so clear that Murdoch was trying to find a shot when he realized the situation. And the, the rest of the McGill forwards just kind of cleared out yeah. some space that, for him. So that presents a perfect opportunity for the slide. Yeah. For nothing McGill as we are nearing three minutes into the second quarter. I'm Stephen Stamp with Pat Gregoire. Thanks for being with us on Lacrosse TV. We are proud to be bringing you the 2018 Gataway Cup. Barnable got the short stick on him, but that's some great defensive work by Connor Plant. Ball is still loose, and Matt Karastechi just can't come up with it. They do get it, though. Now Bolsterly's going to shoot. I was willing him to shoot, but he misses, and it will be U of T ball. That's the one thing with the, pole, the long pole shot, of course, is you, you don't necessarily have time to get somebody down there to get possession if you miss. You want to make sure that's one where, I mean, in so many cases in field across, missing the net's not such a bad thing, but in there, you have to get the ball on, on the target. Yeah, no doubt. As much as we like seeing a long stick take a shot there, you, you, you got to be pretty sure of it. And it was a nice take, but like you said, no backup there. So Toronto's going to get possession again. And Jason Barnable was all the way back. He's the one who went back and attained possession of Toronto by racing back into the end. We saw that at the other end of the field. In the first uh, in the first quarter, when Toronto had a, a shot in transition, and uh, he zipped down and got possession back. Now AJ Masson with the ball, watched there by Bolsterly, slips by him, almost gets tripped up, man manages to maintain his balance and possession. 
Here's some space and a shot. Nice save, though, by Michael Gallo on the chance by Alex Emerson. Outlet pass. Here comes Brendan Byrne. You're familiar with Brendan Byrne? Yeah, Brendan Byrne played his first year of uh, box lacrosse with the West Durham Ironheads, a team I coach. And uh, his older brother, Mike Byrne, also went through our program as well. And boy, uh, if you know Mike Byrne's game, his game is exactly like Brendan Byrne. Uh, both just absolute workhorses, a utility player as Tim Mur Murdoch before the game you know, put it. And uh, you're not going to find too many guys that work harder than the Burns. Miguel setting up Seth Obadia. Behind G, below GLE, comes back out, tosses to Murdoch. We'll switch to the far side. Initiating from the top. That's Colton Campbell wearing number 98 in white. There's a save once again. Just getting that stick on it was Macon Jeffries. Interesting, uh, Colton Campbell, if you are looking on their on the Kufla website, which you should be, kufla.ca, all the stats, all the information is there. Great story about the history of these two franchise, these two programs, yeah. both dating back to the 19th century. But uh, Colton Campbell left his jersey, thought he thought it may have been stolen. Turns out he left it in the hotel in Peterborough <laughs> when they went to play play Trent. So he's wearing 98 in white, 00, zero in red because they haven't got the jersey back yet. It's on route. Yeah, there you go. Loose ball push. And Toronto will get possession. And once again, Jason Barnable, the All-Canadian. Up into the offensive zone. And he was back all the way back in the defensive end. He's doing a yeoman service here and going up against Tanner Balden. And somehow, hold on, did he score? Oh, it's good. Stayed out of the crease under tremendous pressure from Tanner Balden. He said in the last M McGill goal is good defense. I'm not sure what else Tanner Balden does there. I, I, I don't think Tanner Balden could have done anything. That's just a one-man wrecking crew. That is Jason Barnable, the All-Canadian, goes coast to coast. And that's just the type of player he is. He can do it all. He, you know, he'll play some defense. He'll run the ball in transition. And then he'll casually score a beautiful goal right on the crease. And that, we've mentioned it several times during the, this evening already, this afternoon and this evening, in the, uh, the Brock Nipson game. And again tonight, that play all started with a block of a shot by Zach Holmes. Just gets his stick in the lane, knocks the ball loose, taps it ahead to a teammate. And that's how Toronto came up with possession. That led directly to that scoring opportunity and ultimately the goal. And there's Zach Holmes once again. Not going to get to keep it this time. There's a loose ball in for, uh, possession infraction. But boy, Zach Holmes, the defensive All-Canadian. Barnable and Holmes have both been great. You can see why. Yes. On, on a team that went four and six, they drew the attention of their their opponents throughout the league to, uh, to, to honor them as, uh, as All-Canadians. Kieran McKay will start with possession. Tosses it far side. Chase gives it right back to him. Looks like McKay's looking shot, but he makes the pass away. Now, I'm not sure if that hit the goalie or the crossbar. I believe it may have been off of Jeffries. He's fixing his uh, his helmet. So yeah, so something. maybe off the bucket. Yeah, That's a heck of a save. Oh, and he was up in the way, and then... <laughs> He gets a little shot in on Patrick Turner after Turner's <laughs> creeping into his crease. I like the feistiness of Macon Jeffries. I always enjoy a goalie. He'll get out and make some contact. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Macon Jeffries, he, he's got a lot of energy. When he makes a big save, he's out there giving props to his, his defenders. He's always loud. You can even hear sometimes yelling here from the press box. <laughs> and we've got the windows closed. McDonald's shot. That one's going to go wide. Jeffries may have gotten a touch on it, and there he is again, directing traffic, signaling what he'd like to see, where things are going. George Brown's got to come up top side there. He came out flat-footed and yeah. just got easily burnt there. A little more aggressiveness. It's, it's tough when you know McGill has so many weapons and will, will move the ball, keep it hot. It's hard to jump out. You know, your tendency is to sag a bit. There are times you got to just, you just got to commit. McGill slows things down, a little slip, but they maintain possession. They lead four to one. And that's just generating his own shot there, Andrew Chase, but can't quite find the back of the net. 
Here's Obadia trying to initiate. He's watched by Keane. Didn't like what he saw, so they throw it up to the top. Almost a strip there by Holmes. It's interesting, you know, I mean, you see the, the contact, the little poke checks and things, and here's a chance for McGill. And it doesn't necessarily seem like much contact, but there's some great pictures by Alyssa Symbolista from Trent. Um, does a great job taking pictures. There's a hard rip. That one's off the, the goaltender and the crossbar, I think. Another save. And boy, the U of T fans down below us are enjoying this game as their team really performing. But boy, she's got some pictures of the defenders with the poles making their contact. And you can see the bend in the sticks. There's another save. Macon Jeffries just got a tiny bit of that one. That's all he needed. Ball goes out of play and Obadia will start things up again. Boy, we have to pick the players of the game later. And the early contenders for Toronto, there's the three of them, and I don't know how you pick one of them. <laughs> Between it's, Holmes, it's, it's Barnable, and, uh, and Jeffries. I think Jeffries might get the tie break just with the, the abundance of saves that he's made. And, and not just, you know, how many saves he's made, but, you know, how, how good the saves have been as well. Yeah. Boy, I like how Zach Holmes is playing those two. McGill, though, leads 4-1. to one. We are just past the midway point of the second quarter here in the second quarter final at the Bagadaway Cup 2018 at University of Toronto's Varsity Stadium. Brought to you on Lacrosse TV. I'm Stephen Stamp with Pat Gregoire. Again, our apologies for getting a bit of a late start on this one, but it, the games will be up and archived so you can see the part of the game that you missed earlier on. And uh, Toronto doing a pretty good job here. Remember, tomorrow we will have the semifinals. The first game at 1 p.m. will be the Trent Excalibur, who finished first in the East, taking on the winners of tonight's earlier game, the Brock Badgers. Hope you weren't planning to watch that one later and not know who had won. <laughs> Sorry if I spoiled it. The second game will be the winner of this game against the two-time defending Begataway Cup champion, Western Mustangs. and They're looking pretty good again, as is Brock, as is Trent, as is McGill. Yeah, I, I think you could make a strong argument for any of those four, top four teams uh, to make a strong push for a championship. Obviously, you know, Western, the two-time defending Bagataway Cup champions. You have Brock, who looked great in their quarterfinals as well. And then Trent, uh, another team that, you know, has made a lot of strides uh, in the last few years and looking for their first Bagataway Cup championship. And then, of course, this McGill team here as well, who... Uh, I believe two uh, Begataway Cups for them, and uh, they're a program that year after year, always a contender. Yeah, and a young team. Uh, we yeah. mentioned earlier, just one player graduating from the program. Eric Van Nees. Eric Van Nees, so they'll have lots of guys back. Obadia will start, watched by James Keene. Keene in chemical engineering, the Toronto native, and Obadia is from Port Washington, New York. He's taking economics in his third year at McGill. Well, his third year. As a student, first year at McGill, yeah. coming from Lafayette College. Yep. Liam McDonald's just waving everyone away, saying, "No, nope, I'm going to go and start this up from behind." He's watched there by Aiden Gould. Gets by him, comes out, tries to pass across. It's knocked away, but it bounces straight out to the opportunistic Patrick Turner, who bounces it home. Great recognition from McGill, recognizing, all right, well, we have a skilled player being matched up with a short stick. So what do you do? Take him behind GLE, initiate the dodge. Of course, the pass from behind didn't initially get to anyone, but great heads-up play, as you said, pretty opportunistic as, as Turner just grabs that loose ball and puts it home. Back to the face-off dot, and where Gardy Hur, the All-Canadian, has his hands full with Caden Jackson. Boy, Jackson is battling out there. You can see her cranking on that stick, and Jackson is just grinding away. <laughs> Quite a battle between Brendan Byrne and Zach Holmes as well. Byrne 20 for McGill. And he's pointing to where the ball is. Ian Holmes, 19 for Toronto, fighting for position. Boy, these are some long face-off battles. Now we're gonna have a violation. And the refs are gonna discuss to see 
They're going to redraw. redraw it. Redraw. Okay, no violation. Just freshening things up. Kyle Cropman, a former Fogo for the Brock Badgers, so he's no stranger to the tricks that face-off <laughs> men tend to do. We got Sean Grenier, though. The uh, crew chief is in there observing this one. And you can see Jackson just driving that shoulder and trying to push Gardy Her back, but her so strong. Pulls it back out, scooped up by there by Brendan Mullen. He throws it back. It's dropped momentarily by Bolsterly, but he'll throw it back to Gallo and escape pressure. Barnable again all over the field, putting the pressure on, but you can't do it on your own up there in the offensive zone. Kai McDonald. Down low, Turner scored the last goal. Back up top to Zawada. This is Max Murdoch taking the pass and then returns immediately up to Ian McLeod. Six and a half to go here in the second quarter. I'm Steven Stamper with Pat Gregoire. This is the Big Hadaway Cup on the Cross TV. A lot of fighting off some pressure from Sean Powers having a strong game. Holmes will pick up Kai McDonald. Oh, that's wide open opportunity for Patrick Turner. Nice draw and dish by McLeod, but Turner just not able to find the mark on that one. Yeah, all that pick movement up top is just some of these defensive midfielders are kind of getting lost and Turner wide open there as a pole had to slide, but he misses Mark just once again. Toronto not seeming to be too worried about who's matching up with whom. They're really just kind of taking, taking the people that are into their area and trying to stick with them. That shot blocked by Holmes, of course, as Max Murdoch couldn't get it through. Obadi is gonna track it down, a little pressure from Samuel Gaskin. And McGill gets the timeout. Decides to stop the clock with 5.20 to go here. In the first half, we will take a break at halftime. We'll be back, remember, tomorrow, 1 o'clock for the first game, Trent versus Brock. 4 o'clock, the second semifinal, Western against the winner of this game. And, Pat, what do you, uh, does Toronto have a chance to climb back into this one? And, and if so, is it just the longer they can hang around, the better that chance is? Yeah, absolutely. I, I certainly think so. And I think the way that McGill plays with it, being slow and methodical as the game goes along it's the not playing into their hands but you know the, the offensive possessions that we've seen from Toronto they've, they've looked all right they've been getting their chances it's just McGill is such a strong possessional team and as we've mentioned before Toronto with a couple of costly turnovers they just have to take care of the ball a little more uh, because possession is so key they're doing a great job on the faceoffs getting it it's just far too many costly turnovers in, in the neutral zone. The mood here definitely picking up as the rain has stopped. Uh, yes. it, was, it was cold and windy earlier. The first thing I saw when I arrived today at Varsity Stadium, got up into the media, into the press box, was one of the tents on the far side of the field. Um, you can see the tents there. There's one with the scorers and right behind it, there's another one. The one behind had sides up on it. Uh, they were trying to protect a little more from the in inclement weather and the wind just picked it up and toppled it head over tail all the way down into the corner of the, of the stadium and uh, I was with the one of the managers and he just got on the radio and said uh, yo hey Bill and he's like yeah I see it and they were on it they tracked it down but no sides on the tents and that is why um, if you're wondering why the tents don't have sides but it's uh, it was a fairly blustery and, and not particularly pleasant afternoon but with the rain stopped the crowd's really enjoying this game for the uh, the hometown University of Toronto Varsity Blues Obadia with the ball behind the net. Watched there by Keane. Pass out to Murdoch. Pops away from him. Snagged by Holmes. He's going to go for a run. Passes it across. Nice lead pass to Sean Power. And they immediately start to put some pressure on. Not sure what that call was. I didn't see. Looked like offside. Was it outside on Toronto? Yeah. Is there a changing? you got to be very patient, very precise with yeah. your changes in field lacrosse. Yeah, and uh, that's the thing, too. We talked about turnovers. Yeah, necessarily, you know, turning. They were smart, slowing things down mm -hmm. with the ball, but sloppy change. Uh, it doesn't matter if you hold on to the ball. 
Uh, Darren Elliott had the ball and thought he might have a lane to the net. He had 18 goals this year. The uh, management student from Whippy. It was <laughs> so. It's so hard when you're standing there with the ball. Something happens on the far side of the field. You have to put it down and walk mm -hmm. away. <laughs> he, he just didn't want to do it. Yeah. Well, Battier in behind the net again, tosses it out. Near side to McDonald. Tries to spin, picked up nicely by Power. That pass knocked down. Holmes tries to swat it ahead or tap it to himself or his teammate. But it's going to be Turner swooping in, getting possession back for the Redmonds. We're under four minutes to go in the half. Turner, another Toronto, Ontario native. Just been a buzzsaw on loose balls in the offensive zone. Oh! That is a sidearm rocket from Liam McDonald. Just changes the, the plane a little bit. Drops it down and, and lets her go. Yeah, with v velocity like that, I don't even know if you necessarily really need to change planes. It's an absolute bomb from the outside, and I think that's the style of play that, that Toronto is prepared for. But when it comes to it, the ball movement's so good. you you got to try to get out to hands, but with a quick release like McDonald, it, it seems almost impossible uh, for a short stick d -Midi. Looks like we might have another extended battle here between Jackson and Har. Sorry, her, Guardy her. And Toronto may get this one. Oh. No, violation, so McGill will get possession. They almost had it. James Keene was ready to pounce. Mm -hmm. There's Tanner Balden. Three McGill defenders scored last week. And there's one right there. We saw Bolsterly rip one earlier. Now a shot. Balden makes good on his chance. And that is... That, now that is a long pole goal. An absolute rip from your wrong side. Sending it far side. That is an impressive goal from an impressive player. Tanner Balden, one of the best defensive defenders in, in Kufla lacrosse. And just showing how Ooh. versatile he is when he yeah. gets into the other end. Remember the goal last year? Was it? It was in the final, was it not? That uh, Josh Harris oh, forced overtime. Yes. With a, a shot similar to that one, where I mean, that was a gorgeous play by Josh. He's one of my favorite defenders to yeah. watch in this league. Jo and, uh, Josh was a little more on the run. This one was plant yeah, your feet and put everything into it. That's a good point. Wait, that's not Gardy Her. That is Julian Smith Vudoris. Pharmacology student from Stovall, Ontario for McGill. Taking that face off. And we'll get a timeout with 124 to play. Four 20 minute quarters, running time, other than stop, stops for timeouts or injuries, or if the officials need to stop something to deal with something, to adjudicate a situation, uh, except for the final three minutes of the game. And it will be stop time there and the clock will stop on the screen and we won't see it our uh, clock on our screen is linked to the stadium scoreboard so it is the official time that we're seeing but it stops with three minutes to go and they just keep the time down with the officials i like when they keep it running i like to see exactly how long it's left me too <laughs> me too i've got to agree so seven to one and mcgill you talked about they're methodical, they're patient, and they kind of grind you down a little mm, bit. They do. And you could tell, actually, especially with that last goal uh, coming from McDonald. Uh, it was strong defense from U of T. They were keeping, their, their, you know, keeping the, the shooters to the outside. They're getting out on hands, but as the ball just kept moving around, shot goes by. And like you said, they kind of lulled the defense to sleep because when the ball came back out to, to McDonald on the wing, Two defenders were drawn right in the middle, and it just they didn't have enough time to get out to hands. And I think yeah. that's what McGill tends to do. Uh, for you know, obviously, some of the top teams they they expect that, but but a team like Toronto that don't have the depth at defensive midi and long stick, those guys are gonna get tired, mentally and physically. Here's the matchup we've been watching: Jason Barnable with the ball, Tanner Balden on him, 
And right now, Baldwin is outscoring Barnable, which is not necessarily something <laughs> we expected to see. But th as we mentioned, three McGill defenders scored as McGill beat Bishops 10 to three last week. Very impressive win for the, the Redmen at home in that playoff game. Yeah, that, that one was almost one all on defenders and, and goaltending too. Mm -hmm. Michael Gallo was, was outstanding as well. 52 seconds in the first half. Barnable loses his footing, takes a whack over the helmet, and there's the flag. Was surprised not to see it coming. It was just a, I think it was just a matter of reaching into his pocket to get that flag out. So here's an opportunity for Toronto to mm -hmm. creep a little bit closer. 30 seconds left in the half. How many penalty minutes Baldwin had in the regular season? I don't think it was a lot. Well, six and a half. Yeah, in the course of the season, most on the team, so he's not going to shy away from the physical play. Absolutely not. Six seconds. Toronto needs to come in and get a shot. I'm not quite sure. He's going to let the half end. That surprises me. I, I you know what I think that they. Just they rather gain position. Yeah, I don't know. I really have the ball know. to start the second have half. The, that's I'm the only thing. On the, yeah. yeah, I mean, that is the one thing. You hold on to the ball there. You, so you gain you position. Start. There's no face off. You have possession to start the second half. But I half. feel like you still maybe would have been able to at least get a chance to score yeah. and get the possession behind the net. Yeah, just make sure you've got somebody to exactly. and get a shot but, off. But, but I guess they want to be just sure, just yeah. in case that they absolutely have something. Yeah. All right, the score is 7-1 to one in favor of McGill Redmond over the University of Toronto Blues. I am Stephen Stamp with Pat Gregoire. This is the 2018 Bagataway Cup at Varsity Stadium in Toronto on Lacrosse TV. Thanks for being with us. We'll be back in 9 minutes and 18 seconds. <laughs>